Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Matthew Cobb. He's a professor in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Manchester. And today we're going to talk about his latest book, As God's a Moral History of, Ge of the Genetic Age. So, Dr. Cobb, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me back, Ricardo. I must point out to the confusion of potential buyers, there are two titles to the book. Oh, okay. So the English title, which is the original one, is The Genetic Age, um, Our Perilous Quest to Edit Life. The US title is rather more dramatic, As God's a Moral History of the Genetic Age. So they have genetic age in common, uh, but you know, publishers <laughs> have different views on what they think will sell. Yeah, thank you for that, because for a second I forgot that that usually happens. There's a British title and a Ameri an American yeah. title. Yeah. It did happen once, when I, it happened with my first book, and The Lancet, uh, the British uh, medical journal, reviewed it twice under the different titles, and nobody, they were, both reviews were good, but nobody noticed. Except well, at least they were both good, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get into this then. So... Uh, how long have we as humans been changing genomes? Well, I think you can probably argue that we've, from the very beginning, in the same way that every, every species changes the genome of the species with which it interacts, in particular predators, um, and whether we're hunters or gatherers, that's what we're doing. We are altering, we're choosing certain organisms to eat or to move out of our territory, and that will change their genomes effectively because we're, we're a force of selection but clearly that wasn't done in any way consciously um, and I think we can argue that there's, there's kind of three phases the first phase is just existing on the planet so yeah three four hundred thousand years uh, and in fact further back even when we weren't human uh, and then when we began to domesticate animals which took place in a whole series of waves probably first with dogs and clearly dogs and wolves are the same but different so we, we we selected the dogs that would be nice and wouldn't bite our hands off uh and so that was again changing their genomes and then with agriculture in particular uh, then we very clearly decided to use certain crops certain animals and not others and we can actually see this in the genome uh, genomes of our domesticated animals. So, for example, the horse, we can see that around about 4,000 years ago, that the horse genome changed substantially as we suddenly adopted uh, a new strains of horse, new breeds of horse that were much more amenable to domestication and much stronger and so on. Uh, but the same thing happened to plants and even uh, without us knowing at all, we did performed early forms of biotechnology by using, selecting without knowing it, certain yeasts that would produce uh, bread or beer or wine. So this has been going on unconsciously. And then gradually, as people began to realize something about how the whole process was working, and they'd breed like with like, this, is, this really took off with selective breeding, which became at its strongest in the kind of uh, about the 17, 8, 1700s. And that also, incidentally, eventually gave us insight into heredity and what was actually going on. So even before genetic engineering and this deliberate manipulation of genomes, there have been these three phases of pred predators, domesticators, and then finally uh, genetic engineers. Mm -hmm. And about genetic engineering, what are the, of course, you've already pointed to some of those, but what would you say are the most crucial differences between it and other kinds of uh, unintentional genome altering that we've been doing before that, and that you would say are the most relevant for uh, the kinds of topics you explore in your book? I think the fundamental thing is that it, in the early 1970s, it became possible to deliberately and precisely change genomes uh, with some knowledge of what we were doing. So before that, we had discovered at the beginning of the century or in about 1920s, 1930s, that certain things like x-rays or certain chemicals could introduce mutations 
but I mean, this was before it was even certain that DNA was the hereditary material. So all you could do is observe that, you know, if we bombard a fly with x-rays, we're going to get more flies with weird bristles or something. Um, so mutation was known as being a inducible, but it's essentially random. You can't tell what what kind of mutation you're going to get. And this has been underlying the the, the mutation selection has been underlying the, the, the global success of our agriculture right up until the 1990s. That is, that's how we've got all the crops we've got. They have been mutated by x-rays or whatever. And then people have selected out of that random mutation particular variants that they thought would be useful because they'd increase yield or they'd resist desiccation or, or whatever. So the difference with genetic <clears throat> engineering is that initially in a quite a crude way you could introduce known sequences known bits of dna into the genome of another organism and i think that is the that's the qualitative change i mean there's a lot of argument historians get very cross about this and some of them say no 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 it's all the same you know going back to domestication or even predation you know we mean it's all the same change of genomes but i think there is a qualitative difference when you have some control over what you're doing compared to you're doing it effectively blindly without even knowing or needing to know what the genetic material is. Now we can do it very, very precisely. And clearly in the last kind of 20 years, that change has become even more exquisite and precise and our ability to control the precise letters of DNA and where they're changed that has that has become incredibly rich now. Mm -hmm. So your book focuses a lot on the moral side of genetic engineering. When was the first time that people uh, stopped for a bit, paused and thought that, <laughs> OK, so perhaps we have to think a little bit more about what we are doing here because this might have some bad consequences? Well, I think very significantly, in fact, they were doing that before they could even do it. So in the 1960s, when uh, the even, even before the real tools were developed, when it became apparent that this was on the horizon, then um, people like Marshall Nirenberg, who'd uh, just got the Nobel Prize for his work on the genetic code, he was arguing that we shouldn't be doing this or we should be thinking very, very carefully before it takes place. So scientists were aware that this could be done in the future. And they began to argue about it and debate about it. And Nuremberg, for example, said, well, as soon as this becomes a reality, then we should have a pause. What very soon because it became called a moratorium. And they took the term moratorium from the uh, discussions that had taken place in the 50s and 60s over uh, uh, atomic testing in the atmosphere that people argued that we needed a, uh, a pause in that that should stop because it was potentially well it wasn't potentially dangerous it was dangerous um so they were thinking about it right from before the beginning which i think is really quite a lesson because um there are lots of techniques that are now available and i think that lesson of we need to know before we do this whether it's safe and how it can be safe we can see that applied today uh, in particular, we're going to talk about this later on, uh, in the work around gene drives, which are manipulations of the e ecology. And people like Kevin Esfeld, who's one of the pioneers of this, have been very vocal in saying we need to think of all the possible dangers before they can happen. And one of the reasons for that, so it's not only a moral issue about whether this should be done, but whether it can be done safely. I think that was the key thing that really motivated people uh, initially and still today, because if you think about it, the, the, the kind of health and safety regulations we have, all our regulation, I mean, people in the railway industry, for instance, say that their, their regulations are written in blood because what happens is something terrible happens. There's a terrible accident and people realize, well, we shouldn't have done that. We should institute this kind of safety regulation. And as Sidney Brenner said in the 1970s, the difference between that kind of accident and the kind of thing we're potentially dealing with genetic engineering is that those railway accidents or airplane accidents or whatever, they tend not to be self-replicating. Whereas if, we, if one of these things goes wrong with genetic engineering, then things could 
really get out of hand. And I think that that has been around for the last 50, 60 years, this awareness of the potential, a very different kind of potential. So that that's my concern. It's not a moral. My interests are not primarily moral in terms of um, some higher you know, good or whatever. It's simply about, well, are these things safe and what will be the consequences for us if we implement this particular technology? Mm -hmm. And you talk about different uh, pauses in time, you call, you call them pauses that geneticists made, for example, back in the 70s. So what happened there? Well, scientists in general are very proud of this, <laughs> or geneticists <laughs> are. Um, and one of the things that struck me in, in researching and thinking about the book is that four times in the history of genetics, uh, geneticists have said this technology is potentially so dangerous that we should stop for a while. And as far as I'm aware, this is the only science, the only technology where its practitioners, its advocates have decided to stop. There's no other science, there's no other form of technology where people have got so alarmed that they have stopped doing the work that they are supposed to be doing and that they're, they're passionate about. Even the atomic bomb. So during the Manhattan Project, during the Second World War, uh, once Nazi Germany was defeated and it was clear that the Germans not only couldn't use the bomb, but they never had it anyway, uh, many people working on the uh, Manhattan Project discussed whether they should carry on because that had been their primary motivation. <clears throat> And although they discussed this and they even sent a, uh, a letter to Roosevelt, which wasn't in fact sent, they didn't know this. They thought they'd sent a letter to Roosevelt, but the security <laughs> services stopped them getting it. Um, they never actually stopped work, whereas genetics has been different. So there's a, a kind of moral high ground, I think, in, in some kind of way about genetics. People have been thinking about this. It's not me just coming along 50 years later and go, oh, we should think about this. It's, this has been at the very heart of this technology from the very beginning. So the the event that most people know about uh, and the geneticists, I mean, undergraduate you know, student geneticists get taught this, or they should do, uh, is an event, <clears throat> it took place at a place called the Cinema in 1975 in February, where there's a big conference uh, to discuss how the early genetic engineering called recombinant DNA, which is relatively crude, uh, could take place safely. And all this was done with microbes. So it's done with viruses and bacteria. It wasn't at the time any possible uh, genetic engineering of any higher organisms. And this meeting fairly kind of a mixture of a kind of academic conference and a very bad tempered student meeting. If you imagine, if you've ever been involved in student politics, you can imagine quite how awful that might have been. Um, this took place in February 1975. But in fact, there's a huge backstory. So the first pause in fact took place even before genetic engineering was a reality and it took place in 1971 and it just involved a handful of people only a handful of people knew about this um when uh what happened was that paul berg was planning to his real interest was to understand uh, mammalian gene function and that was completely unknown at the time and so what he was planning to do was to uh introduce known uh, human, known bacterial genes, which we knew the function of, into a mammalian cell. And for that, he wanted to get bits of these bacterial genes, which were well understood, and use a vector, a viral vector. Uh, he was going to use a well-known vector called SV40 and use that, which infects mammalian cells, to put these bacterial genes into a mammalian cell. So that was his project. And as a kind of side project, he suggested to one of his uh, PhD students, well, why don't you do the, you can do the opposite. You can get an SV40 gene and put it into a bacterium. Why don't you do that? So um, she goes off to, uh, she's still doing a PhD. She goes to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to learn about techniques of mammalian cell culture with a researcher called Bob Pollack. And she explains on the course that she's going on um, what she's going to do. And Bob, being fairly sensible, said, wait a minute, you're going to get this SV40, which there's a lot of argument about, but certainly in, in hamster cells, it can produce cancer. And there's argument about whether it's safe to work with humans because it infects mammalian cells. You're going to get that gene and you're going to put it into 
E. coli, which is a bacterium that lives in our gut. This seems crazy. <laughs> so uh, he phones up Paul Berg, who was on, he didn't know, I mean, they didn't know each other. Um, Berg's on the other side of the country in Stanford. And uh, he says to Paul Berg, well, why are you doing this crazy experiment? And Berg, in no uncertain terms, says, well, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? Get lost. Uh, and they kind of have a row on the phone and then put the phone down. And then Berg talks to a lot of people and they generally go, you know what? Why are you doing this experiment? It doesn't seem to have any point, which it didn't scientifically, because what he was really interested in was the opposite of getting bacterial genes into a mammalian cell to understand their function. So this idea of putting this SV40 into uh, E. coli was actually a bit of a bit pointless. Um, so he in the end, after talking to people, he phones up, phones up Pollack and says, you know what, I'm not going to do that experiment. So the first pause happened without anybody knowing, just, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 people around the world knew. Uh, and Janet Mertz, who was the scientist who uh, was supposed to be doing this, she ended up on another project, which turned out to be much more fundamental in terms of developing uh, genetic engineering. So I think it was a win-win all round. But then once Mertz and in particular um, Berg and Cohen had developed this method of what's called cloning, of using uh, plasmids, which are tiny little circles of DNA in bacteria, to be able to move DNA from one species to another, then it became clear that, in fact, this was a technique that was much more uh, amenable to just doing anything. I mean, that's what Berg said, that with this new technology, any, anything was possible, basically. And that led to, in 1973, when this all became apparent, led to a lot of dissent and worry amongst the scientific community. And uh, it, again, like Bob Pollack, it was the younger researchers who heard about this at a, uh, a conference and they went to the conference organisers and said, look, you know, is this, uh, is this safe? Should we be doing this? And this eventually led uh, to the first moratorium, which was called for in what's generally known as the Berg letter, because Paul Berg uh, was the main signatory, or is the first signatory on the on the letter, which involved all the great and the good of genetic engineering in the USA, which was pretty much the only place that was doing it at the time. Uh, and they said, look, we're, we call on everybody all around the world to stop doing this. This was in 1974, until we can be sure that it can be done safely. So I think that's really important. What they were arguing was not any moral issues at all. They were simply saying this may not be safe, pretty much the same as Berg had been convinced in 1971. And that was the point of the Asilomar meeting, the outcome of this argument and public debate. And so it, it took on a, a, a public level. There were meetings all over the world about this new technology and whether it was safe. And uh, the Asilomar meeting in 1975 had one sole aim and that was to agree effectively the secure biosecurity protocols that could be used to allow this technology to be put into place so there was no moral discussion it's very very striking there's no discussion uh david baltimore one of the organizers says at the beginning of the meeting no we're not going to discuss any moral issues we're not going to discuss human genetic engineering we're not going to discuss commercial applications and we're not going to discuss bioweapons and one of the things that is <laughs> very striking, so they were focused solely on can we do this safely? And some people who'd signed the letter, uh, original letter calling for a moratorium, like Jim Watson, had changed their mind in the meantime and thought the whole thing was a fuss about nothing and they should just get on with it. What we now know is that uh, unknown to most people at the meeting, the patents for genetic engineering, the Cohen uh, Berg met the Cohen uh, Boyer method for uh, gene cloning. There was a patent had been taken out. So the financial implications were already there. The potential application, technological application and immense wealth and potential ecological destruction, if it all got wrong, was already there. But this was not known except to a handful of the members uh, of the participants in the meeting. Secondly, something which I worked out by some not terribly complicated uh, checking of names and indexes is that the Soviet delegation to Asilomar, and there were five of them there, the Soviet delegation who were widely kind of 
sneered at and ridiculed by the uh, upstart young Americans as being these old duffers, because they were all in their late 60s and 70s. They were members of the Academy of Sciences, etc. But these people had no idea what, the, what, what was going on. They really didn't get it. That was what people said. But we now know that the Soviet Union had already in 1972 begun a program of biological weapons development and the people who were at Asilomar were the, and came over as fools were the people who were driving it. So there was in fact a terrible, really dangerous underlying current at Asilomar that nobody except the Soviet delegation had any idea about. Mm -hmm. And with this meeting, did they reach their goals? I mean, were there good enough regulations set in place for laboratory research, for example? Well, nothing's gone wrong so far. I mean, <laughs> I think I think that's that, that that's you know, people were very worried and rightly so. But a whole series of things. I mean, and this caused a huge row in particular in America, but also you know, around the world in the UK. There were debates, there were meetings, there were protests. Uh, in particular in the USA, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, so not Cambridge, England, uh, it, where Harvard and MIT were wanting to develop these technologies. Uh, so there were big public debates about this. It was a major social issue of the time. And firstly, it turned out that, well, yes, the protocols were pretty safe. I mean, as long as you, you know, they would, depending on how dangerous it w was, they were you know, basically, you know, don't touch it, don't eat, don't eat it. Don't don't do it here is the ultimate, the, the highest level of biosecurity. And that has to be done in uh, very, you know, basically germ warfare labs. Uh, those those biosecurity protocols are still in place and they effectively uh, have saved us from individuals from being infected and the world from being damaged. But I think it's also right to notice that the as well as these kind of public debates, a, lo a load of scientific concerns were actually alleviated in two ways. Firstly, because this technology was being applied very quickly. It was realized that you could, for example, make insulin. And this was the great project of Genentech, uh, inspired by the work of or developed by the through the work of um, Herb Boyer, that you could actually make an insulin a human version of insulin. I, I, it's hard to get over quite how significant this is because we don't realize this. Most people, lots of people take insulin today. Very few of them, I suspect, realize it's been made in a genetically modified microbe. Before this became possible, the only way you had of getting insulin was using animal insulin, which is not identical to human insulin. It's got an extra amino acid and eventually it causes all sorts of unpleasant allergic reactions. But by reverse engineering the gene for insulin. So they didn't know what the gene for insulin in humans looked like, but they knew the amino acid sequence mm -hmm. of the insulin protein. So they could then convince the cell, the bacterial cell initially, to produce this stuff by making, in introducing a DNA sequence that corresponded, well, not in fact to insulin because insulin has to be assembled, but to pro-insulin, a, a, a precursor uh, of it. So it's a bit more complicated than that, but, but we can just imagine that they got the gene, they got the amino acid sequence for insulin. They made a gene that corresponded to that because uh, the genetic code is redundant. That is, there are several bases, several codons that can code, that code for more, that code for the same amino acid. So they just chose ones that they thought seemed right, stuck it into a bacterium, and eventually, after some fiddling around, amazingly, it worked. They, they'd previously had success with a smaller human gene or a smaller human protein called somatostatin, which is a, a growth hormone. Both these were projects that were co-financed by Genentech, one of the big start, well, one of the tiny startups at the time. But the key point is that all this rapid technological development proved to be done, one, safely, and two, to have really significant applications and, let's not forget it, potential wealth for those who are involved. Um, and the other thing is that one of the main concerns people had was about the manipulation of human genes in bacteria. And because it is a complete chance, it discovered in 1977 that non-effectively genes in everything but bacteria 
are not in one simple sequence. They are very in, in what are called eukaryotes, so higher organisms. Mm. The genes are actually broken up into lots of little bits. And that meant that if you stuck a human gene, you just got a bit of a human gene from you or me and stuck it into a bacterium. The bacterium go, well, I don't know what to do with this. I recognize the first bit. But then what happens here? I don't know what to do because they don't have the cellular machinery to, to splice the gene uh, together. So in fact, it turned out the things that people were really worried about getting human genes and putting them into bacteria turned out to be absolutely non-problematic because nothing's going to happen because the bacteria don't know what to do with it. So these whole set of things. So uh, one the kind of steam went out of it. Uh, there are plenty of other things at the time to be worried about um, looming Cold War, uh, new Cold War. So, you know, nuclear threats. Uh, chemical threats, so there are lots of things to be worried about uh, in the late 1970s. And genetic technology didn't seem to fit the bill because it was being done safely, because there was lots of money to be made, and because of these worries about human genes turned out to be non-existent. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you now about particularly genetically modified organisms or GMOs. So are there any issues with them? <clears throat> well, it depends what you mean by an issue. So the, <laughs> the, 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 so the, the, the development, in particular, we're referring to plants. And that's the main way that uh, GM organisms have been, been in, uh, are in our food chain or are, people are interested in. So very strikingly, people don't get upset about the GM yeast or bacteria that are producing drugs. Mm but which everybody depends on. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it's even possible to get animal insulin. And certainly if you had a choice, there's no reason to take animal. You wouldn't want to take animal insulin because eventually it will stop working or make you ill. So there are these GM organisms which are living in vats, which are microbes that nobody cares about and which are producing drugs and have made vast wealth uh, for some people. Incidentally, they haven't led to a drop in the price of insulin in the USA, despite it being much cheaper. So drug prices in particular in the US are to do with other things rather than uh, you know, ease of production. So the main things that people are concerned about are GM crops. And I found working through, because I didn't know anything about the history of how GM plants were developed. And it was absolutely fascinating and amazing and surprisingly, historians of genetic engineering or of genetics have just skipped over this, which is of major significance. It was a big scientific challenge and has clearly been of major significance in around the world, in Europe, but in Africa, in China, in the US uh, for the last kind of 30 or 40 years. So it's very surprising that there wasn't already a, a body of work that I could still investigate this. So I had to go back and do all the, 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 the primary reading. And um, the, uh, the, the, the main baddies in this, if you talk to anybody about it, are Monsanto. And uh, Monsanto, which now no longer exists, the company was finally broke, bought up by Bayer uh, and then trade names disappeared. But they got an awfully bad reputation. But m they funded in the late 70s and early 80s a whole series of researchers in Europe and in the US to try and develop techniques for introducing DNA into crops. And the reason they wanted to do it, I was absolutely fascinating. So Monsanto at the time were a chemical company and they produced um, they produced napalm. <laughs> they, <laughs> they produced, uh, you know, plastic grass, AstroTurf. So, you know, everything that was uh, they produced DDT, everything that, you know, 1960s America was kind of anti-natural and horrible was Monsanto. And their CEO at the beginning of the 1970s said, literally, these, these are his words, he said, this is not sustainable. We cannot carry on doing this. You know, the world won't accept it. The public won't accept it. We need as a company to get out of chemicals. And so the brilliant idea they had was rather than using DDT or some uh, artificial insecticide to kill insects, which is if you're going to be a farmer, you've got to kill insects because the insects want to eat your plants. So you've got a major issue in, all over the world of producing 
crops and the way that organic farmers organic farmers are allowed to produce use insecticides is by using something called bt which is a bacterium and that bacterium quite by chance quite naturally produces a chemical that kills certain insects in particular caterpillars so that's already that that's a technique that was already in existence and what monsanto said is look if we could get that gene that bt gene from this bacterium and put it into a plant then you'd have something that would naturally produce an insect a natural insecticide which is acceptable to the organic farming community and that was their motivation and i find that extraordinary that this company that's got such a bad press and quite rightly because of the way it kind of went off the rails in the 90s um nonetheless had as its initial motivation something that i think is very hard to argue against but the issue with bt with the issue with gm crops is that it's how the crops are made so i said earlier on that now we have an exquisite ability to change very precise genes that's not the case with the gm crops that are in fields all over the world at the moment the genes that do the business that make the plant insecticide resistant or i think more perniciously perniciously uh, resistant to herbicides um those genes have been introduced more or less at random they can't be the techniques that were used were not precise and secondly to be to know that the procedure had actually worked you have to have not only the gene you're interested in but also various uh, marker genes that enable the scientist to say okay well this this plant has got the the relevant gene and it's that i think together with the um the very aggressive marketing uh, and legal action taken by companies like uh, monsanto which has led to this great fear uh, i mean you've got to remember that this technique was developed in the mid 1980s and wasn't actually put in the fields until the late 1990s and one of the things that's very apparent is that there's a a coincidence of the arrival of gm crops into uh on in, into fields being driven in the late 1990s by what's called the the world trade organization which have recently been set up so this was part of a global politics of freeing trade removing trade barriers enabling companies to sell whatever they want wherever they want which caused a lot of hostility in particular in europe um, and then the terrible uh, mad cow outbreak mad cow disease outbreak which was bad enough in the UK so that's when cows got this neurodegenerative disease in the early 1990s and the government said no it's quite all right don't worry there's no evidence of it ever causing problems in humans which actually technically is still the case except that uh, eventually uh, this uh, new variant as it's called of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease appeared in humans and around about 180 people all around the world all of virtually all of whom had some connection with being in the UK in the late 1990s died of this horrible disease. So there was a massive, unbelievable food security fears spread everywhere. Uh, and in particular, obviously in the UK and in Europe, um, I think in many places in Europe, you still can't buy British beef. There's still concern that the, um, the, the disease may have, uh, maybe in, 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 the, in the cattle. Uh, and I, I mean, I remember this. Um, we stopped immediately eating any kind of beef. And my, my children, who were very young at the time, they grew up thinking that we had some strange religious belief about not eating cows, that we were Hindus or something. You couldn't do this. They couldn't quite make. Well, we didn't explain it. So it's just said, don't eat the beef. And we grew up. In, they grew up in France uh, where there was very few cases. But even so, we were very concerned about it. So this was a massive issue. And all this comes together around about the turn of the millennium there's probably a bit of kind of millennium craziness as well <laughs> got in there and this causes huge protests demonstrations everything is conceived as being alien these are weird alien plants they're being imposed by them uh, which you can actually kind of identify as not only the USA and the World Trade Organization but even as Monsanto they are copywriting they're patenting their their genes that are in the plants which is true uh, they are trying to tie farmers into 
a, uh, a production system, which is true, and they are they are taking out court cases against poor little farmers who appear to have um, uh, hoarded illegally kept grain from one season to another, which is also true. So there are, there are lots and lots of reasons why people got very, very cross about this. Uh, and it's not simply because GM crops. I mean, GM crops, my view on them is, yeah, they're, I mean, A, they're, they're, they're quite safe for us to eat. Um, if you go to the USA and you have any nachos, which are made out of corn or maize, if you prefer, you've eaten GM because virtually all, all US uh, maize is GM crop. So you've eaten it. Uh, and if you buy uh, many, most, an awful lot of cotton from around the world is also GM. It's got the BT, that gene that stops uh, the cotton borer, which is a caterpillar which will chew its way through the crop. So it's it's safe for us to eat. It's not going to cause you any harm. It doesn't cause animals any harm. On the other hand, what's very striking is that it hasn't actually led to an increase in productivity. Uh, even the US Department of Agriculture, all its figures show is that there has been no increase in productivity despite all this ingenious manipulation of plants by scientists around the world. The one good thing it has done, and I think that's it's absolutely clear, is that the use of BT crops, which was the initial one they developed, uh, has led to a reduction. It's been calculated around 700 million tonnes of insecticide less has been sprayed around the world. Uh, and that is, uh, that's good. Uh, on the other hand, it's very striking that Virtually all BT crops just do two things. They either stop, they either stop insects, so that's BT, or, or virtual GM crops. So they either BT or they uh, are, are you, they're resistant to herbicides, and those herbicides are trademarked. So basically, the company this was Monsanto's cunning idea. Uh, the 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 the, in, the herbicide will kill everything except your plants because they've got a gene that enables you to resist it. So that means that you can rear your plants closer together because the weed, you don't need to worry about getting into weed them and they grow stronger, except that it hasn't led to any increase in productivity because the, uh, the strains of plant that you have manipulated have been those that have been best to be manipulated, not necessarily those that grow the best. Plus conditions in the world vary all over the place. Plus you end up with uh, including with BT crops, you end up with resistance uh, emerging. And uh, in the case of the herbicide resistant crops, Roundup and, and similar uh, insectis, uh, herbicides, well, let's leave to one side whether they're dangerous for humans. There's a lot of argument about that. Uh, I wouldn't use it. Um, but uh, above all, if it runs into water courses, then it causes havoc with amphibians and they've got enough problems as it is without adding to that. So the, the jury is very much out, I think, as, as to where we're going with certainly existing GM crops. Uh, the uptake by the farming community is massive, absolutely massive. Uh, so if you speak to a farmer about it in America, they're going to go, well, what's the problem? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't need to worry about the corn borer or the, the, the cotton borer. The most surprising thing I discovered was that this is not simply something that people in Europe or America are worried about. China has been and is the focus of an immense debate about this. And we have generally have a, a view of China as being a kind of monolith with debate being crushed by the party. Mm -hmm. um, well, the party itself is heavily divided, uh, although there is there are GM cotton crops, BT cotton crops are widely grown in China. China was in fact the first country to ever grow a GM crop. It was tobacco. Uh, and the US said, uh, could you not do that, please? Because it will harm our tobacco exports. And China, this was back in the 90s, said, all right. So times have changed. They wouldn't say that now. Uh, but the, there's this huge debate in China about whether rice should be genetically manipulated. And there are forces within the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese army who say this is all a Western plot. It's going to make us infertile, all the kind of stuff you hear uh, from any kind of anti-GM campaigner. But this is something that is going on in China. And the uh, uh, Greenpeace, amazingly, is allowed an astonishing freedom to mobilize and organize and you know, end up with TV programs on major TV channels about 
this problem. So this is not this is something that's very widespread. And I'll, I'll close on this. It's very striking, I think, that we've got this. On the one hand, we're OK with GM microbes giving us drugs or taking drugs that have been produced through GM technology. That's OK. But when it comes to eating something, that's different. And there's clearly a, a psychological thing about what you put into your, into your mouth and the, the, the cultural and social and psychological significance of food that is different to taking drugs. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something there for people to explore. What, what is clear is that scientists get very cross about this. You know, people who are involved in the industry in particular say, look, people should just pull themselves together. It's all quite safe. What's the problem? That doesn't work. You know, you can't <laughs> say that. You, you know, it's not going to stop people from being suspicious. You need to, unfortunately, I would say, you need to go with people's fears and try and find ways of working around them. Simply denouncing them as being irrational uh, has never proved very successful, I don't think. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about gene therapy. So what kinds of effect, uh, techniques or therapies are out there and what might be some of the risks associated with them? Well, gene therapy was being thought about uh, right from the very, very beginning. This was much more than b before genetic engineering was possible. People were thinking about changing human genes and curing genetic diseases. Uh, and that was the primary motivation that was in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. That's what people were, were dreaming about, scientists. Um, and very quickly, there were various attempts in the 1970s and 1980s to do very crude and very alarming uh, forms of uh, introducing genes into humans um, in what were really rather bad experiments. Uh, nobody seems to have died from them, but certainly nobody was cured or saved. And this really became possible towards the end of the uh, 1990s. Uh, with the development of what's generally called gene therapy, which is a similar kind of idea. You introduce genes into tissues. So this is not it's not creating superhumans. This isn't affecting what's called the germline. So every cell in your body or your eggs or your sperm. Uh, so it's not a change that will be passed on to the next generation. But it's things that you know, many genetic diseases appear perhaps later in life uh, and they affect particular tissues so you try and address those particular the those particular problems by introducing a gene into those tissues and uh so there's various forms of uh, immune deficiency so bubble baby disease you think of the, this well-known babies who are born with a severely damaged compromised immune system and have to live in a literally in a in a bubble because they, if any contact with the slightest microbe will cause them great problems and that was one of the main focuses and it proved remarkably effective for a while until it was discovered that the viruses because you've got to get the stuff into the dna and one of the ways you do this is use a virus which will insert itself into the genome together with the sequence that you've put into the virus so you put it in there and you, but you don't know where it's going to go because viruses well they don't quite go at random and that's the issue Sometimes they have what are called hotspots. There are places in the genome that they find attractive to introduce themselves. And it turned out, for example, in the case of one of these uh, trials that was taking place in France, uh, that the children who were being cured of their immune deficiency disease were also some of them getting leukemia because the virus was going into a part of their genome that then it caused a mutation effectively. So, and some children died of this. So that was a big kind of worry. And similarly, um, there was a very famous case, uh, a young man called Jesse Gelsinger, who was who had a, a relatively mild genetic disease that he that was under control he, by taking lots of drugs and following a suitable diet. He was okay, and he volunteered. Uh, he was eighteen. Uh, to be a, a control in an experiment, just to show you know what would what would happen to somebody with the disease with this new therapy. And so he was injected, and he had a massive uh, response to the vector. So it's the virus that produces this terrible response, and the poor 
poor boy died and that really again set the field back for about a decade because if the issue is the vector how do you get this stuff safely and if you're doing this in a mouse or in a fly it doesn't really matter you might even be what you want to do i mean people have been using insertion points like this in drosophila the fly uh for years to create mutants because you actually want to disrupt genes and see what happens but you don't want that to happen if if that's a human being and that's their cells and that is going to be introduced into their body and potentially produce cancer or terrible uh response so the issue has always been the precision we're getting back to that point the precision of what you do and what looks in a little diagram like a beautiful reliable safe insertion of a gene isn't so safe and reliable when you don't know where it's going to go uh, or if there are other stuff that you have to introduce alongside that so whether it's gm or uh, gene therapy the same issues uh, really throughout the, the the latter decades of the 20th century the same issues were troubling uh genetic engineers that it wasn't precise enough and there was other stuff that they needed to introduce that hung around and people didn't like that or they didn't like the idea of it uh and all those contributed to problems associated with both uh gm crops and um gene therapy mm -hmm. So we talked about uh, pauses made to the work of geneticists back in the 1970s, but more recently in the book, you also talk about pauses in 2012 and 2019. So why were, did those happen? Yeah, well, this relates to the... So what happened around about the beginning of the century was that end of, end of the last decade, end of the 1990s, early noughties is that scientists began to develop much more precise ways of editing uh, genes. Uh, initially, these were very complicated, uh, but they could, by using the cells repair mechanisms, they could convince, depending on the state of the cell, they could convince the cell to introduce some DNA uh, of interest into a particular point. So you, if you knew a, a sequence, you could alter it. But this was very, very cumbersome. Nevertheless, it heralded uh, a new phase of something which used to be very sexy, but it's kind of declined a bit in the public awareness. That's synthetic biology. So the idea that you could put bits of different DNA and different genes were like a kind of a Lego construction kit. And you could get this and put it in here and put it in here. And that's, you know, a very glib and imprecise metaphor but the basic idea is there and these techniques were there from the uh, late 1990s gene editing began to be used as a, a phrase coined by Fyodor Ernov he initially called it genome editing um, and this became a, a reality and what people began to do couple at this point links in with more geopolitics I've talked quite a bit about politics already and this I mean it rumbles throughout that's why I called the book or it's got the title, the bits, the genetic age in it, just like there was the atomic age, which changed everything about culture. The same thing happens has happened, I think, with, with genes. Uh, and one of the things that happened at the beginning of the century was clearly the 9-11 attacks. And that led to a, a, a huge increase in funding from, in, in the US in particular, uh, with regard to germ warfare. They got very worried that uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union's stocks of uh, genetically modified bacteria and viruses, which had been engineered. I mean, that actually happened. They did do that. There have been bioweapons made. None of them have been released, thank goodness. But the Soviet Union did make them. And my guess is China did. Quite possibly Israel has done as well. And it's hard to say for uh, the major Western countries, US probably, UK, maybe, France, maybe uh but certainly we know that the soviet union had these weapons and with the collapse of the soviet union in the early 1990s the west became very alarmed that these things might get into the hands of terrorists furthermore this new easier way of doing things seemed very attractive we know this because documents found al-qaeda documents found after the collapse of afghanistan uh 
say that, uh, well, the West keeps on saying this is really interesting technology and it's dead easy to apply in a very dangerous way. We should try it. And indeed they did. They didn't succeed, but they were trying to have a go. So one of the things that people became aware of was that there was the possibility of manipulating genes in all sorts of ways, new discoveries about, say, inadvertently, some, some ecologists, Australian ecologists, inadvertently discover that you can make smallpox resistant to vaccines. I mean, that's just terrifying. Smallpox, one of the biggest killers, one of the few major successes we've had is eliminating smallpox from the planet, except for a handful of uh, laboratory stocks. I mean, every now and again, people discover new laboratory stocks in freezers. They go into freezers in some godforsaken place in the USA and they open the freezer. It's got smallpox in that. So there's still some of it floating around, but it's not an active disease. But these uh, Australian uh, these Australian ecologists trying to study mouse pox, which is very closely related, to get rid of mice, invasive mice in Australia, they inadvertently discover how to make smallpox resistant to uh, vaccines. So there's a huge concern coupled with this global security threat of uh, Islamist terrorism that leads to and the collapse of the Soviet Union and what's going to happen and great uncertainty. The US starts to fund what's called gain of function studies. So that's increasing the dangerousness of bacteria and viruses. Now, the aim of this was not primarily to um, create new bioweapons or wasn't wasn't said to be that. This was all done in the public domain. But the arrival of SARS meant that so that was um, a, an early uh, pandemic that took place in China in 2002, or its epidemic, didn't reach pandemic proportions. But it was clear that there was the possibility of a new spillover from uh, wildlife into humans of dangerous diseases. And so the idea was, it's kind of two pronged. We can predict what will, if we know what is what could happen to this the genome of this particular virus, then we can predict the course perhaps of a future pandemic. Secondly, we might also be able to second guess what the terrorists are doing. Now, those terrorists are a fantasy in that there's no evidence that any terrorist group actually succeeded in any of this, but that that's all what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads eventually in 2012 to this decision to have another pause after the 71, 74 is one, in, and this is much more serious. So in 2011, Ron Fouchier, who's a, a US funded uh, uh, virologist working in Rotterdam, he goes to a conference in Cyprus and says, well, I've done something, literally these are his words, I've done something really, really stupid. He says, I have quote, mutated the hell out of H5N1 bird flu virus. And that is about, H5N1 is about 10 to 100 times more dangerous than COVID. It is really, really nasty, but it can only be transmitted from birds to humans or from human to human by contact. Mm. Except that Fouchier had now made it transmissible through the air. He'd done that deliberately to try and see, was it possible? And he was so alarmed by what he'd done, to his credit, that he called for another moratorium. And in 2012, this takes place and gain of function studies begin to be the focus, not only of great concern from biosecurity point of view, but also the stuff of uh, uh, you know, increasing fantasies uh, about, in particular, after the uh, after COVID-19 arrives, about how COVID-19 came to be. Was it genetically engineered? No, is the very short answer to that. There is no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, and although we don't know exactly what animal it came from, it almost certainly came from an animal, almost certainly probably from a bat. That's where all the data point to, and it's a naturally occurring spillover event. But uh, there were many during the, the, the in, 10 years ago, got a whole series of uh, worries in the USA about uh, leaks from labs, or you know, ordinary uh, labs. So you know, uh, the, the, they reconstructed the Spanish flu virus from, from 1918 and accidentally shipped this out with ordinary flu samples. I mean, this is just crazy. There's really worrying things were happening in the USA. And this led to a big clampdown around 2014, 2015 on funding of gain of function research, but also uh, on the security protocols that were 
in place in in, in laboratories. Um, so that's what the 2012 thing was about. And those gain of function studies have now started to be funded. There's a couple, I think, that are now funded in the USA. There's a lot of arguments about whether they should be funded or not. I mean, my view is, I think COVID-19 shows that in terms of a prevention, this is not a useful approach. It didn't help in the slightest bit. Gain of function studies played no part in uh, understanding the COVID-19 pandemic or which we're still living through or in predicting what's going to happen next. They're, 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 nobody's come up with any interesting insights in that respect. Um, and my view, which is mine, I'm not a virologist, but that means I have no skin in the game, uh, is that this is too dangerous and I don't think it should be done uh, at all, but that's that's my view. <laughs> uh, so the second the second um, moratorium, the second pause, uh, which hasn't act is not in fact a pause because the only point in doing this is if everybody agrees. And as far as we know, in 71, 74, and 2012, everybody agreed. But in 2019, after He Jong Ki, a, a Chinese scientist, <sighs> carried out genetic engineering on uh, well, at the time, it was thought two human embryos. We now know that there were at least three um, and saw those embryos come to, to life, being born um, with potentially catastrophic consequences because uh, the gene editing, which was supposed to be like a pair of scissors, he called it gene surgery, was more like gene butchery. Uh, the uh, mutations he wanted him to introduce, and there's no medical reason to introduce them, uh, did not occur. He introduced other mutations that we've never seen in any human. Uh, there were not all of the cells of these girls are the same. So normally every cell in our body has the same genome, unless you get cancer and then it starts to do something wrong. These girls have got their mosaic. They have different genes in different cells. We don't know whether that's going to have any terrible effects on them. Hopefully not. Uh, but also there were the, the the gene editing that he introduced this CRISPR technique that was finally kind of demonstrated to work in 2012 although it's often called a pair of scissors we now know that depending on the state of the the cell in which you do it uh in particular in mammalian cells then huge bits of the genome can be eliminated we don't know if that's the case for the the the, the girls um and Rightfully, the Chinese government is not turning them into a circus, uh, but it would be reassuring to know if they were OK. But we don't know anything about that. As a consequence of this terrible, terrible experiment, uh, this mutation, I mean, they were not healthy before he got his hands on them, which took which was announced to the public in November 2018. At the beginning of 2019, lots of scientists said we should stop. We should have a pause of five years on manipulating the human embryo. So in other words, carrying out genetic manipulation that will change future generations. And strikingly, many scientists refused to sign up to that, including, for example, Jennifer Doudna, who's the co-inventor of the CRISPR gene editing technique. She said, look, the gene is out of the bottle. It's going to happen. We should just live with it. Um, so that's a, a moratorium which is not applied by the scientists most countries around the world such manipulation is illegal with one very striking exception and that's the usa in the usa if you've got money you can do what you want uh, their federal rules prevent you from using federal money for manipulating even a stem cell because of the arguments of the religious right that a stem cell or an embryo is a full human being and therefore has a soul and so on and so forth. But if you're rich or you've got, you know, your private funded lab of which that they do exist, you can do what you want. So this might yet happen uh, in America, although I think the growing concerns about these unintended consequences for what is supposed to be a pair of scissors, but in fact looks a bit more like a chainsaw uh in mammalian cells in particular is perhaps cooling people's excitement so do you think we have time for just one more question yeah yeah yeah. no you can carry on let's go i've got another quarter of an hour so yeah oh okay great so uh, another big topic nowadays particularly because people have some people have been talking about applying it to potentially wiping out mosquitoes is gene drive so 
what are gene drives and what might potentially be their ecological impact? So gene drives are a very clever idea that was dreamed up uh, by uh, a man called Austin Burt in uh, the beginning of the century at Imperial College. And this was purely a theoretical idea. And what he, he was just wondering what would happen if you had a gene that encoded what's called a nuclease, so it cuts DNA. And that, if you have that gene, it, if it was targeted, the nuclease was going to try and find a sequence where it was. So if you've got a gene, and just before it, you've got a, a set of ACTCT, whatever. And if that nuclease gene recognizes HCTCT, then if you've got a, a heterozygote organism, you've got one copy of a gene on this nuclease gene on one chromosome, and you've got nothing on the other, you've got the ordinary sequence, then what the gene will do is produce the enzyme, the nuclease, which will target that ACTCT, whatever I said, cut the DNA there, because that's what a nuclease does, and then the cell will go, oh, I've got a gap. What's happening on the other chromosome? Oh, I've got a sequence there. And it will then fill it in. So now, from having just one copy of a gene, you've got two. And that's what Bert was just musing about. He said, what would happen? And he worked out that if you had that, then basically you get exponential, in a diploid organism with two copies of each gene, you get exponential growth that every generation, the number of copies of this gene is going to double in the population. And then he thought, well, what if we attach something to this, what's called a homing nuclease gene, something that does something like makes an animal sterile or means it is resists malaria, say. And these are the examples he used. It's purely theoretical. Well, you could in fact drive, that's where gene drive comes from, you could drive this character through a wild population incredibly quickly. It would, and I don't think this is a, a bad metaphor, uh, and it's actually been used by the scientists, it's a genetic chain reaction. In other words, it's a genetic nuclear bomb. You could conceivably, if one of these things got out, it would just copy itself crazily through the population and would alter effect as far as it could reach, as far as mating took place. So this is both one absolutely terrifying, but as Austin Burt said, what is the price of not developing this technology? And I think that's what we've got to always remember. So none of the, you know, in all the people I've studied, apart from some of the medics who were kind of, you know, a handful of maverick medics who were very arrogant, like her junkie, and really thought they were doing the right thing and didn't care about anybody else. Virtually, certainly all the fundamental scientists I've come across, I've read about, I've interviewed, have all been incredibly sensible. And that's the case for everybody who's working on gene drives. I don't know any crazy people who are working on gene drives. They are all think that this is very potentially dangerous, but it could change lives, save lives, because at the moment, around about 500,000 people a year die of malaria, the vast majority of them children under five. And that's with all the insecticides, the bed nets, the health campaigns, all the stuff we do we're still losing half a million people a year. Now, if you could make a way safely, ecologically, without any ecological disturbance of making the vectors of malaria, which are the mosquito, mosquitoes are just carrying this tiny little organism, a plasmodium that causes the damage in us. If you could alter the mosquitoes safely and reliably and all the rest, why wouldn't you? And that, that, that's the dilemma. So you've got this potentially dangerous technique if it goes wrong, but potential significance, immense significance if it goes right. And that's, that's the problem that we've been struggling with since, I mean, as I said, Bert came up with a theoretical idea. It was eventually carried out actually by accident. <laughs> Some scientists who simply wanted to have lots more copies of a mutation in a Drosophila that they were studying that's all they were interested in. There was certainly a particular mutation. This PhD student couldn't get enough mutants out of his system. So he thought about it and he thought, basically, he didn't know anything about 
there have been huge debates that have taken place and he had no idea his supervisor had no idea about this and they thought okay well why don't we just use this we could think he dreamt up basically the homing endonuclease he thought well i'll get my gene put cap it with these bits of dna that are going to find their location and hey i've got lots and lots of you know flies with weird bristles or whatever it was he was interested in and then so he did this it worked and then he and his supervisor they said they kind of looked at each other and said wait a minute this is really dangerous should we even publish this because and they they, they put in the title of their article uh, that it was a genetic uh, a genetic chain reaction that was the title of the article because they realized what they had the potential problems associated with this so again we're coming back to scientists realizing and work, pulling you know raising the alarm well, as they're doing it, or even before they're doing it, in the case of Kevin Esfeldt, who's developed these ideas much more rigorously, uh, or in the application, the potential application of gene drives much more uh, rigorously than anybody else, I think, and has been very concerned about us working out everything that could go wrong before it's actually applied. And they try to come up with very clever ways of meaning that the gene drive will dissipate or will stop working when a certain number of uh, recombination events because whenever you have sexual mate sexual uh, reproduction your genes are crossed over they're mixed up that's why we're all different and if you made it so that there were two bits of this gene drive and they would become separated inevitably after a certain number of generations then you could release one of the things and you'd be okay that it wouldn't actually survive for very long because all you'd need to do is to reduce the level of malaria in a particular population and then you could uh, cure people of uh, uh, reduce the number of, of uh, mosquitoes, then you could cure people of malaria. So when the mosquitoes came back, they wouldn't be biting people with malaria. They wouldn't. So that's the main source of you know transmission is you bite the mosquito bites somebody who's got some malaria. The mosquito's now got malaria and it then transmits it to somebody else uh, when it bites somebody else. That's what happens. So if you cure malaria in people, you'll very quickly get rid of it completely. But that highlights another possibility. So everybody's very excited about this. Clearly, it's very kind of sexy and seems neat, if terrifying. But there may be other solutions that are available. And um, for example, there's now a vaccine that's just been trialed, a, a malaria vaccine, which has 80 percent efficacy, which is nowhere near as good as the COVID-19 vaccines, which are fabulous. And if you haven't been vaccinated, you really need to. But that's enough 80 percent would be enough to lower the level of malaria in the human population and therefore reduce the transmission eventually it would it would disappear so perhaps we don't need this fancy untried rather alarming genetic bomb we may be able to deal with malaria by more traditional uh, techniques the key thing about gene drives is what will be the ecological consequence and how can people who are going to live with this these particular consequences how can they take uh real prior informed consent how can they understand what's going to happen or what's going to happen in their village if for example most of the population are illiterate this is one of the issues in Burkina Faso where this is being studied the population's illiterate there's no word for gene in their language so how can you explain how can you really convince and explain to people because people have got to know what's going on in their place not enough for the government to decide the local community needs to decide and have a veto if they don't want it happening so one of the ways that people are doing this is by using theater to explain to non-literate populations what would be involved on the other hand interviews make it very clear that people still don't get it and are still worried that something half human half mosquito um, is going to be produced but the key issue, as I say, is the ecological one, uh, in that although lots we, we know our, our understanding of ecology, ecology is rubbish in general uh, and in tropical regions where the mosquito pr is prevalent uh, even more so. But to reassure us, the groups that are in favour of this say, well, look, no single organism relies upon solely upon mosquitoes. So there's nothing that's going to starve to death because it can't eat mosquitoes as flies or as larvae. Now that's true. But then when you look at the list of animals that do eat mosquitoes at one point or another in their life cycle, it is immense and vast, covers the whole of the animal kingdom. 
Mm. And so it would only, you know, you don't need to be, you know, a car carrying ecologist to work out, well, actually, if, if, if several of these species go a little bit hungry, not starve to death, but just a little bit hungry because their food source is not available, or one of their food sources is no longer available, there might be some weird cascade that takes place. And that's, that's my concern. Uh, and I, I know that the people who are doing this work, who want to uh, apply it, not for the sake of, you know, being, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, well, he wasn't Dr. Mr. Frankenstein, um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, Dr. Strangelove or any evil genius, that's not their aim. They want to save lives, it's the whole point of what they're doing. And they're aware of this potential difficulty as well. And so at the moment, there is no plan to release any of these gene drives. Uh, people are carrying on developing them in the laboratory. They seem to work. You can eliminate mosquito cages. Uh, you release one of these things and it makes the animal sterile in a very complicated way. Because, yes, you can transmit sterility, which is a bit, a bit weird, but it works, trust me. Uh, so it, it, the, these are techniques that could work. Or it could be that we don't need them uh, and that more reliable, safer, less dramatic, less sexy ways like a classic vaccine may solve the problem for us. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, and since I think it's important that uh, this information about genetic engineering in general is communicated well enough to people in general, do you think that the press does a good job there in communicating <laughs> about its risks and benefits, its potential and drawbacks? Well, yeah, I mean, press gets a bad press uh, <laughs> and it deserves it. It deserves it a lot of the time. But, you know, they're getting often they're getting the information from scientists. I think we are not we're not un, we're not without responsibility in this. Uh, and scientists tend to or university press offices uh, tend to big up their discoveries. You know, in five years time, we'll be able to do X. It's always five years. We'll be able to yeah, de-extinct the mammoth in five years. We will not, you know, it's just not, it's just, we don't even know the number of differences in number of bases between a mammoth gene genome and uh, an Asian elephant genome. So there's all sorts of hype that gets floated about, about that. I mean, that's fairly, it's fairly innocuous, uh, but the more kind of insidious danger that is uh, presented, as you, you suggest, I think is important. Uh, and I think it's the duty of scientists to be a bit more sober in their claims, in their ambitions, uh, in their and aware that, in particular, if you think about what's happened with COVID, mm -hmm. that their suggestions of or, you know musing of an interesting theoretical possibility about a lab leak, which is indeed possible, it is conceivable that the Chinese were indeed cultivating uh, the uh, coronavirus because they wanted to know what could happen and it got out of the lab. I mean, I don't, ex that is not impossible, but there's no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would emphasize the latter point. There's no evidence for it. And all the evidence we have points in a different direction to a natural spillover event at uh, the Wuhan food market. But, you know, scientists need to be aware that their, uh, their views about I mean, we've seen this so much in the last two and a half years about masks, about vaccines, uh, about genetic engineering. You know, the, the scientists are sometimes bad people who want to gain fame and notoriety and all the rest of it. But in general, I think they're not. They, but they're perhaps a bit foolish. But you need to think about your words and how they could be misinterpreted, which is why whenever I talk about this, I'm always very clear. Now, it doesn't stop somebody from clipping out and say, look, he said it could be a lab leak. Um, but I've done my best to make it clear what the evidence is. And of course, if the evidence changes, then we have to change our views. I mean, that's, you know, only a fool would do otherwise. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the claims for genetic engineering, for gene therapy in particular, What's very striking is the whole business about human genetic engineering of the germline with Hujong Ki is that nobody actually asked seriously from the first time that this became a possibility in about 2014, why are we going to do this? Why would we want to alter a human, a future human's gene? Why do we want to, in fact, create a human? allow a particular kind of human to be, come into existence by manipulating their genes because there is no you're not saving anybody's life you are allowing that that life to exist 
which is rather different. You can save somebody's life by, I don't know, uh, curing them of uh, some genetic disease that is in their blood when they're an adult. That's fine. But engineering of embryos is actually precisely that. You are allowing that form of life to come in. Now, why might you want to do that? And people say, oh, well, it's genetic diseases. You know, we can cure genetic diseases. But what's very clear over the last few years since the He Jong Ki debacle, the horrible experiment he did, is that people go, well, wait a minute, why, why, why are we doing this? Now, they should have asked that earlier. And the answer is that the only people who would benefit from this technique in terms of genetic diseases aren't the individuals you're going to allow to create because they don't exist. You know, you can't, you know, they're, they're, you're not saving their lives. They don't exist yet. You are, you, you are allowing something to come into being. It's like saying, well, we didn't have sex last, last night. We saved somebody's life. Or, you know, we'd, babies appear. And it's only when they appear that you've got a, a thing to worry about. So um, the only people who would benefit from this technique are parent, potential parents, people who want to have their own biological child without a genetic disease that they carry mm -hmm. furthermore they would have to be either both couples both have a recessive two copies of a recessive disease so that's a disease where you need two copies to be affected so both people would have to have exactly the same genetic disease and two copies one on each chromosome mm -hmm. or one parent potential parent would have to have be uh, a, a homozygous, homozygous for a dominant disease, like say Huntington's disease. So you've got two copies of that gene. Now, because with everybody else, what we do at the moment is you do pre, if you've got a genetic disease in your family, you do pre-implantation screening. So basically you have IVF, which is horrible. Let's, let's be quite clear. Anybody who's been through IVF or knows people who have got women in their family who've been through, men are very keen on our, on this. I've rarely heard a woman scientist going, yeah, yeah, we really must do more of this because it is awful. Anyway, you have IVF, so you've had all your hormones, you've harvested, as they said, dozens of eggs, which is all pretty gross. And then you fuse egg and sperm in the lab and you choose which embryo is not affected. That's what we do at the moment for all the vast majority of people who have genetic diseases and know about it. And you do, you select the, the, the embryo that is not affected. The only people who couldn't do that are those groups, that, those two groups of people that I described. So this is a technique that would be applied to meet the desires, not to meet the desires of those people, not to cure any babies because they don't exist, to allow those babies to come into exist in order to meet the desires of those people to have a biological child that was not affected by their genetic disease. So how many couples are there or potential couples, potential parents around their world that meet those criteria. We don't know, but uh, the estimates suggest there are a few hundred. That's it. So you've got all this potential danger, because there are huge dangers in terms of inequalities mm -hmm. and so on. As, as one of the leading scientists said, wait a minute, we haven't got equal access to eyeglasses around the world. How is this technique not going to increase inequalities? We know who the parents, potential parents are going to be, where they will live, who would carry out that technique. You know, it's not going to be available in South America, in, uh, you know, in in Africa or in most parts of the world, unless you're incredibly wealthy. So it's for a handful of people. That's the only reason you would want to do this. You can do it more safely, more efficiently now without doing that we have the techniques to to solve the problem and you know what there are lots of babies around the world that could do with being adopted or not babies but grown up you know children so if people re you know why are we exceeding why are we focusing on this desire of a handful of people to have a biological child that is not affected by their genetic disease it seems to me that you know, I mean, there's no right to have a child. It's miserable. Lots of people want to have their own biological child and can't. And that's just the way it is. And I don't see, you know, it seems absurd that all this effort, all this money, all this ingenuity, a lot of very clever people focusing on something that is, in fact, not a problem and carries huge potential 
medical dangers for the offspring if it doesn't go right and at the moment it looks like we don't understand enough for it to be confident it will go right and secondly potential moral jeopardy and ethical jeopardy uh, for all of us Great. So uh, I will be leaving a link to the book in the description box of this interview. Dr. Cobb, just before we go, would you like to mention where people can find you and your work on the Internet? Um, well, you can find me at the University of Manchester, which is where I am. Uh, if you've got a question, you can email me. Heavens, please don't email me with any medical questions. <laughs> I'm not a physician. I'm a doctor of maggots. So if you've got a question about maggots, I can maybe help you. Um, uh, but I don't email me with any medical questions or ethical ones. You know, you've got to work this out for yourselves. I think that's the key thing is that my whole point in all this is to uh, I'm not setting myself up as any moral arbiter. I'm simply explaining where how we've got to where we are. We've got these three things we can do now, which I think are really quite concerning. Gene drives, gain of function studies and manipulation of the human genome in embryos. And everybody needs to know about these things because this has got to be a collective decision. We can't in particular something like gene drives. I mean, what Kevin S. Felt said is a release somewhere is a release everywhere because, you know, mosquitoes or whatever spread uh it's so we we need as a planet to have some kind of regulation of this that's that's my view um well, there's not only what people might be interested in doing is and i'll send you the link uh last year i made a three-part bbc podcast mm -hmm. about this whole issue uh interviewing all of the main uh, protagonists uh and discussing all of these issues in the kind of historical context so it's be a useful background uh, to our chat and I'll send you the link to that. People listen for free anywhere around the world to that. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you for your time and for writing the book, which I really loved and can't recommend enough. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I'll, I'll see you for the next book. <laughs> for sure. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klimpy, Matthew Wittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Wine, Gardner Becker, Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernadini, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Haslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, and Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermitri Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gagey, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetan, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Francis, Thomas Trumbull and Noon Welder and my executive producers Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.